everyone and welcome today's, to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is Samantha DePaola and NOFAS and I'm sitting here with Kathy Mitchell. A few notes from NOFAS before we get started. If you aren't familiar with uh, the NOFAS Roundup, each week NOFAS sends out a newsletter with important information, resources, and invitations to webinars such as today's. If you're interested in joining that newsletter, you can email information at nofast.org. Also, NOFAS is active on Facebook, Twitter, and our new Instagram. We invite you to join us for a conversation on our Facebook on Tuesday, September 26th. We'll be joined by university students and physician champions, as well as our, our affiliates, um, to create dialogue on our Facebook page. Additionally, this webinar will be posted online on Monday on NOFAS's website and on the NOFAS YouTube channel, Alcohol-Free Pregnancy. So we encourage you to type your questions throughout this webinar, and at the end, the questions will be asked to the presenter. So now I'm going to pass it over to Kathy Mitchell, who's going to introduce Dr. George Koo. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as you know, we are extremely uh, blessed and, and fortunate to have Dr. George Koob, who is the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, NIAAA, um, and he's going to talk to us about the neuroscience of addiction. Dr. Koob received his PhD from Johns Hopkins in 1972 in behavioral physiolo physiology. Um, he oversees a wide range of alcohol-related research, including genetics, neuroscience, epidemiology, prevention, and treatment. He's an authority on alcoholism, drug addiction, and stress. Dr. Koob has been really a champion uh, for NOFAS in helping us to bridge the gap in knowledge amongst people that work in the field of FASD. He was very kind to agree to uh, be a plenary speaker up at the uh, FASD International Conference that was held at the University of British Columbia this past March and uh, presented this information to a crowd of folks who have never really considered why some people become addicted. And as, as many of you know, we at NOFAS um, strongly believe that we need, in order to really make a difference and an impact in FASD uh, prevention, we need to really help not only uh, practitioners, but the general community at large understand why some people um, become addicted and others don't. And we have the right guy to talk to us about this today. Uh, Dr. Koob has published over 700 peer-reviewed papers and several books, including The Neurobiology of Addiction. So uh, with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Koob. As Samantha mentioned, um, Please feel free to type in questions at any time during the webinar, and we will be asking uh, the, uh, the questions of Dr. Koob at the end of the presentation. So thank you again for uh, participating, and Dr. Koob, uh, the, uh, uh, it's uh, your turn now. You've got the next 45 minutes or so. Well, hello everyone, and um, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to talk about the neuroscience of addiction, and I'm going to focus on elucidating a medical rationale for prevention and empathetic treatment of alcohol use disorder. So, I, you know, obviously, I think I don't have any disclosures, given that I work for the government. Um, I'm not involved in any uh, private enterprises. Um, and some of the things I'd like to cover with you, and some of them will be, albeit somewhat briefly, but I want to kind of go through what exactly is addiction? What do we mean by uh, addiction? What are the key features of alcoholism? I'm going to specifically drill down into that because I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to use a case history interwoven in between the slides about the brain to give you some idea of where the different stages of 
uh, an alcohol use disorder come into play vis-a-vis -vis how your brain changes. I'm going to make a major argument um, that your brain changes in addiction. And so what are the major functional domains disrupted? What are the major neuro circuits corresponding to these disrupted functional domains in addiction? What are some of the major neurochemical systems involved that correspond to these disrupted functional domains? And what what are the causes? How do you, how do you get there in the first place? Is it genetic, epigenetic, developmental, environmental? Obviously, it's a combination of all of those. And then how does a neurobiological disorder framework benefit diagnosis, treatment, and recovery? And what does that mean for our medical rationale for, for addiction? So, you know, I'm going to put on my NIAAA hat for a minute. And, you know, I want to make the point that, that I don't probably have to convince many of you of, but that the cost and scope of alcohol-related problems in the United States is prodigious. We lose almost 90,000 people a year to alcohol-related causes. This can range from drunk driving to overdoses to uh, accidents. It's the third leading preventable cause of death in the United States. Um, it's, a, you know, a, about half of liver disease in the United States is now attributable to uh, alcohol misuse. 15 million adults have an alcohol use disorder. Um, you know, we, we've been seeing a, a, a steady increase in emergency uh, department visits and hospitalization associated with what I call extreme binge drinking in the United States over the last 10 years. And I guess probably the, the most insidious part of all this is less than 10% of individuals with an alcohol use disorder get any treatment whatsoever. And then the cost of society is also prodigious. I mean, $250 billion a year. I mean, you know, it, almost as much as tobacco costs and, and even more than that produced by all the illicit drugs put together. We study alcohol across the lifespan at NIAAA and alcohol impacts organisms across the lifespan. So. Today, I'm going to focus on adults, and I'm going to focus on uh, the, the, the effects of alcohol on your brain. But I'm going to mention at the end some of the developmental uh, effects of alcohol. And we know, of course, that, that alcohol exposure to the fetus is devastating for development and proper development. And you know, all of these things are part of the, the fabric of alcohol's deleterious effects in society. You know, 70% of Americans drink. Um, most of them don't have a problem, but the ones that have a problem, you know, what what happens? What happens to their brains? What happens to their bodies? And, and how can we learn from this knowledge of what happens to the brain to prevent, better diagnose, and better treat an alcohol use disorder? So, what exactly is, uh, you know, an alcohol uh, addiction? What, you know, it's generally defined as a chronically relapsing disorder that is characterized by a compulsion to seek and take drug or stimulus and loss of control and limiting intake. And I think most people in any textbook you pick up would, would kind of have that definition. But I add on, um, and I'll make some emphasis on this, the emergence of a negative emotional state, dysphoria, anxiety, irritability when access to the drug or stimulus is prevented. And, and I define this as the dark side of addiction. And the reason I emphasize this is because I think this has been a neglected part of the addiction cycle. And, you know, I have uh, done a lot of my own personal research in this domain. I still am in my, my laboratory at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. But I'm not going to focus so much on that today, but I do want to emphasize that it is part and parcel and a big part and parcel of, of why individuals with an alcohol use disorder are so miserable. Now, you know, you've heard me use the word alcohol use disorder, and I did mention alcoholism. So, so what's the difference? Well, there is a major difference. An alcohol use disorder, as defined now by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, of the American Psychiatric Association involves 11 criteria. If you meet two or two to three of those criteria, you could be argued to have a mild alcohol use disorder. And, and that could be, you know, uh, a DUI, which would uh, be uh, 
you know, recurrent alcohol use in situations which is physically hazardous. Um, it, it could it could be problems with it, you know with your significant other at home. Important social, occupational, recreational activities given up or reduced because of of alcohol. But you could then progress to a more moderate or or more severe alcohol use disorder where you would meet most of these criteria and perhaps maybe six or seven of them. And when you get into that state where you actually have, you know, tolerance and withdrawal and you're taking more and more alcohol than you ever intended and, um, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're having problems fulfilling your major obligations at school or at work, that's uh, what we would call a, a severe, moderate to severe alcohol use disorder. And that probably is in the realm of what used to be called alcoholism, although alcoholism really isn't a term that, that's used that much today. And you can see on this slide down at the bottom, these, these, this, this scaling of an alcohol use disorder. So the modern term, the appropriate diagnostic term is alcohol use disorder. So I'm gonna talk about an alcohol use disorder, and I'm going to talk about um, the, uh, you know, the different symptoms of an alcohol use disorder um, um, in the context of a case history. And this is uh, from a book that's listed at the bottom there, uh, Goodwin in 1981. And I'll read along with you the case history, and then um, we can we can see how this fits into what I'm going to describe as the different stages of an addiction or alcohol um, use disorder cycle. So I am David. I am an alcoholic. I've always been an alcoholic. I will always be an alcoholic. I cannot touch alcohol. It will destroy me. I had my first drink at 16. I got, oh, uh, got drunk for several years. I drank every week or so with the boys. I didn't always get drunk. Um, but I know now that alcohol affected me differently than other people. I look forward to the times I knew I could drink. Um, I, I drank for the glow, the feeling of confidence it gave me. Alcohol seemed to satisfy some specific need I had. Of course, I didn't realize it. It was maybe 10 or 15 years before I realized it, let myself realize it. My need was easy to hide from myself and others. There were always reasons to drink. I was low, tense, tired, mad, happy. I probably drank often um, because I was happy as for any other reason. Drinking became interwoven with everything pleasurable, food, sex, social life. When I stopped drinking, these things for me lost all interest for me. They were so tied to drinking. I don't think I will ever enjoy them as much as I did when I was drinking. So drinking came to dominate my life. By the time I was 25, I was drinking every day, usually before dinner, but sometimes after dinner, if there was a reason, and more on weekends starting in the afternoon, by 30, <clears throat> I drank all weekend. The goal always was to maintain a glow. Not enough, I hope, that people would notice, but a glow. My friends became fewer, reduced to other heavy drinkers and bar flies. I fought with my wife blaming her for her drinking, and once or twice hit her, or so she said, like many things I did while drinking, there was no memory afterward. That's known as a blackout. And by now I was drinking at noontime with the lunch hour stretching longer and longer. I began taking off whole afternoons, going home potted. I missed mornings at work because of the drinking and the night before, particularly Monday mornings. And I began drinking weekday mornings just to get going. I then suffered through until cocktail hour, which came earlier and earlier. So what I've just described for you is the first stage of the addiction cycle or the alcohol use disorder cycle, if you prefer. And what I'm talking about is the binge intoxication stage. And this is the area where we use the term incentive salience. And, and what that means is this is a stage where drinking becomes associated with everything in your life, all the cues of anything, uh, you know, uh, many cues that you associate with your daily because that's when you go
Dr. Coop, we're unable to hear you right now. Patient anticipation stage, which is which is green here, and and you know reflects executive functional uh, executive function deficits. And for those of you who maybe the brain just seems like a big glob on top of your head, and more or less it is, um, we have color coded these structures inside the brain, so you can see that the binge intoxication stage actually reflects structures deep in the brain, that's the blue part, which are called the basal ganglia. The, the withdrawal negative affect stage targets structures deep in the brain that are called the extended amygdala, but you can see that the, the green is more on the outer edge, and that reflects the frontal cortex, which is a part of our brain we use to make decisions and perform executive-like functions and make choices and delay reinforcement and so on. So let's just drill down a little bit. Um, and and and, and I'm gonna repeat what I just told you about these different brain regions, but from the perspective of this slide, which is I've, I've told you that the, that the uh, binge intoxication stage is basal ganglia. This controls rewarding or pleasurable effects of a substance in an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is deep down in the blue part. It's responsible also for formation of habits um, and, and drug taking can become habitual. You, you do the same, uh, you go through the same repertoire every night on, on uh, in the bar. You may order the same drink. You may, you know, sit at the same spot at the, in the bar. And this the habitual behavior seems to reinforce the habit of drinking alcohol and the need to engage in more compulsive like drinking. The extended amygdala is the red bit, and, and this is a part of our brain we use for fight or flight. It's involved in stress and feelings of unease, anxiety, irritability. But we know now that those are exaggerated during withdrawal. And that's one of the reasons you feel so lousy in, in withdrawal from, from chronic use of alcohol. And, and, and some individuals may not even experience this unless they actually stop drinking for 24 hours. And then they, they, it's not that they go into a physical withdrawal, but they actually just feel yucky, you know, and maybe get a little cranky and irritable and maybe snap at their coworkers or their loved ones. And, and all of that is relieved when they have another drink. So, you know, the, the, the withdrawal stage is not just the shakes and, and, and people seeing things on the walls. It can be as subtle as just feeling right maybe what you would call a hangover but when the hangovers are regular well then we have to start asking questions the prefrontal cortex is the blue is the green bit it's involved in executive functions as i mentioned the ability to organize thoughts uh, and activities prioritize tasks and make decisions including exerting control of their substance use so you know as i as i as i mentioned the the first stage that i described for david was uh you know, he was finding alcohol rewarding. He was associating it with stimuli in the environment, stimuli present when people use drugs become associated with the rewarding effects of the drugs over time. These cues come to acquire the ability to, to motivate drug seeking in the absence of drugs. And so I think David described very well there in those first couple of slides, how uh, everything became associated intimately interwoven with alcohol. And that is incentive salience. And then the repeated activation of the brain reward incentive salient system triggers habit systems um, leading to compulsive drug seeking. And so, you know, this is probably kind of complicated, but you can see there are two neurotransmitters there in the right hand corner. One is opioid peptides, or what commonly called in the lay public endorphins, and they make you feel warm and fuzzy. And then the bottom one is dopamine, which gets you activated and, and ready to move on and do something new. And, and 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 talk a lot and so on and so forth and those both of those neurotransmitter systems are activated during the binge intoxication stage and drugs activate them in a super super um, fashion much more so than any natural reward and so here's a, a drill down of the binge intoxication stage the neural circuits are uh, in highlighted in blue there, the nucleus accumbens, you can now see it. It's that bottom bit of the blue. I, I said that the key neurotransmitter systems are dopamine and opioid peptides. This is the part of the brain that's involved in uh, when drugs are administered in driving euphoria, intoxication, cue learning, 
habits, overall gestalt is one of incentive salience. So let's move on to David in the next stage. By now I was hooked and knew it, but desperately did not want others to know it. I had been sneaking drinks for years, slipping out to the kitchen during parties and such, but now I began hiding alcohol in my desk, bedroom, car glove compartment so it would never be far away, ever. I grew panicky, even thinking I might not have alcohol when I needed it, which was just about always. I felt physically bad, headachy, nauseous, weak, but the mental part was the hardest. I loathed myself. I was waking early and thinking what a mess I was, how I had hurt so many others and myself. The words guilty and depression sound superficial in trying to describe how I felt. The loathing was almost physical, a dead weight that could be lifted in only one way, and that was by having a drink. So I drank. Morning after morning, after two or three, my hands were steady, I could hold some breakfast down, and the guilt was gone almost or almost. This is a, a, a really outstanding description of when you've kind of crossed the line. The only way David could feel normal and not be set by the devils of what I call motivational withdrawal was by having a drink. So in a sense, David is now self-medicating a situation that drinking a lot caused. And he's trying to fix the problem that drinking a lot caused by having more drink, which is of course making the problem worse. So how does that work? Well, in the addiction cycle, we're now in the withdrawal negative affect stage. This is where a person experiences negative emotional symptoms, stress, anxiety, unease, sometimes physical illness. This is this stage is, is, comes from two sources. One is diminished activity of the brain reward circuits of the basal ganglia, and the other is activation of the brain stress systems in the extended amygdala. So the decrease in brain reward function, you can see on the slide at the bottom where you have a, a comparison subject who has a rich uh, expression in the red there of dopamine D2 receptors in the basal ganglia. You can see that the red means high and, and both sides to the brain of the comparison subject, the control subject, same age, same sex, all this kind of stuff, has a robust dopamine D2 receptor signal using a pet imaging. Uh, but take a look at the one month cocaine, post cocaine use, and you can see this person has diminished D2 receptor activity, and it starts to come back four months later. And there's identical data been shown for, for individuals with an alcohol use disorder. And so the withdrawal negative affect stage engages this, this structure called the extended amygdala, and it does include the nucleus Accumbens, but now the nucleus accumbens is turned to the dark side. The nucleus accumbens is hypoactive. The reward system's not working. And now you're also recruiting the, the amygdala, which is fight or flight. And if you look on the right-hand side there, you can see a whole herd of neurotransmitters that are stress transmitters. These are what are activated when you're faced with an acute stressor. It could be a hurricane. It could be an earthquake. It could be a fire. And you need these transmitters to get you heck out of the building, to get you uh, in a safe place, to get you away from the fire or the flood or whatever the situation is. But if you activate these transmitters chronically, you get the negative affect that I show on the left hand side, which is dysphoria, anxiety, irritability, and malaise. And we know now that there's a double whammy going on with all use disorders and other drug substance use disorders, and that is you lose the reward system, you gain the stress system. And, and that's illustrated on this slide where we show that the neurotransmitter systems associated with stress are activated in the extended amygdala during uh, withdrawal from alcohol use disorders. So what about the third stage? What about the preoccupation and anticipation stage? When does this kick in? This, this is characteristic. Char characterized by a disruption of executive function caused by a compromised activity in your frontal cortex, the front end of your brain. And it's the green here on this slide. This is a bit arbitrary and kind of a, a little bit superficial, but we can divide the frontal cortex into two systems, a go system and a no-go system. The go system can, can 
help drive the craving and impulsive responding for drugs because it gets overactivated. But the no-go system is your break. This is the part of our brain where we're thinking, I shouldn't do that. You know, I'm going to feel really lousy the next day. I'm going to mess up the exam I have on Monday morning. <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to get the term paper done. I'm going to stop drinking. But too much activity in the go system or too little activity in the no-go system can lead to substance use. So if your no-go system's not working, you don't have a break on the system. And um, and so imaging studies in human beings show that people with addiction show disruptions in both the go and the stop system. Sometimes the go system is hypersensitive and the stop system is underactive in, in human beings with an alcohol use disorder. So let's take it from David's perspective. Despite everything others knew, fights with wife, increasingly physical. She kept threatening to leave and finally did. My boss gave me a leave of absence after an embarrassed remark about my quote unquote personal problems. At some point I was out wi without wife, home or job. I had nothing to do but drink. The drinking was now steady, days on end. I awoke at night sweating and shaking and had a drink. I woke in the morning vomiting and had a drink. It couldn't last. My ex-wife found me in the, my apartment shaking and seeing things and got me to the hospital. I dried out, left and went back to drinking. So now he's describing the most severe form of alcohol withdrawal, which is delirium tremens. I mean, I might add he was lucky because about uh, one out of six people who develop delirium tremens can actually die. We do have treatments for it today. And so by getting him to the hospital, I'm sure he was treated appropriate with drugs that can block that, that effect. I was hospitalized again and this time stayed dry for six months. I was nervous and couldn't sleep. Now that's the preoccupation anticipation stage. That's the craving stage. But I got some of my confidence back and found a part-time job. Then my ex-boss offered me my job back and I celebrated by having a drink. The next night I had two drinks and in a month I was drinking as much as ever again and unemployed. That was three years ago. I think about alcohol and miss it. Life is gray and monotonous. The joy and gaiety are gone but drinking will kill me. I know this and I have stopped for now. So another perfect description of the protracted abstinence, the long, long time it takes to recover um, and, uh, and, and to be you know, in a state where you're confident that you're never gonna relapse. It takes a lot of work. It takes changing the brain. We can talk about some of that if people have questions, but the bottom line is that it, you know, alcohol use disorders in some sense are the gift that keep on giving. Um, it's not a, a different than any other substance use disorder. There are residual effects, residual changes in your brain, and you have to actively work to keep the system back in the home, homeostasis. So here's the preoccupation anticipation stage I've talked about, um, you know, uh, some of the executive function dif uh, dysfunctions that are that occur from impulsivity to compulsivity to sleep disturbances to impaired decision making i've talked about the ventral part of the bottom part of the where it says vmpfc that projects down and, and puts a break on your stress systems and on your impulsivity system and the and the top part which actually can drive craving um, I haven't talked about it, but there are specific neurotransmitters we know in the cortex that may be involved. Glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA, which is a neurotransmitter in interneurons. And ghrelin is a new one. It's actually a gut peptide that may also be involved in some of the craving associated with alcohol use disorders. But I think a more compelling description of, of how the brain plays a kind of global role in how well you will recover and how fast you will recover is if you look at this slide, you can see that the individuals who have more, um, uh, you know, less activity, excuse me, let me rephrase that, to have less activity um, in their prefrontal cortex, and that frontal cortex are the ones that are more likely to relapse um, over, a, 
you know, a, a period of abstinence. And so gray matter volumes actually predict the time to relax, uh, relapse in alcohol dependent patients. And you can see uh, the, um, the proportion of patients without a relapse in the purple group is much lower than those in, in the orange group. And, um, and it basically the orange are have more frontal cortex activity and the, and the purple have less dramatically less prefrontal cortex activity and you can see that with the plus 2 and the minus 2 standard deviations away from the mean so i, I hope i haven't lost everybody or anybody but you know i think we can simplify this and simply say that addiction is a moving target. Addiction is, it, it, and is, it is a stages of a process that gets worse over time. It could start with incentive salience disorder components that get you into the cycle. Um, it, as it worsens, you lose reward system function. The, the reason you got there in the first place is you were activating your reward system or overactivating your reward system. Now it's, in a sense, you can think of it as being depleted. At the same time, you've recruited your stress system in the brain, and and the same time you've kind of wrecked your control system, your executive function control system. The combination is is lethal, in the sense of helping to perpetuate the addiction cycle. So, what are some of the factors that that put you at risk for substance use um, misuse? and addiction. I've talked about how the brain changes. What makes the, those changes risky? Why are some people resistant and, and do OK, and, and their executive system kicks in, and they can say, no, I'm not going to uh, overindulge, or and other people are more vulnerable? So we know a bunch of things. We're still trying to work out how they work, but we know a bunch of things. One is early life stressors, abuse, neglect, household instability and poverty. These are risk factors. Adolescent substance use increases the risk of developing substance use disorder. The earlier the exposure, the greater risk. If you start binge drinking at 12, you are fourfold, four times more likely to have an alcohol use disorder than someone who starts drinking at 21. Four times. Research suggests there may be pre existing neurobiological differences in adolescents who progress from no or minimal drinking to heavy drinking. And we know that alcohol can affect those transmitter systems. There's some of the transmitter systems I talked about, uh, notably the stress and reward transmitter system. Genetic factors account for 40 to 70% of individual differences in addiction risk. For alcoholism, we tend to think, talk about about a 60% heritability. Now that doesn't mean you're cursed, that just simply means that the sons of alcoholics are four times more likely to become an alcoholic in the old terminology, or the sons of alcohol use disorder are four times more likely to become, to have an alcohol use disorder. Alcohol use disorder and substance use disorders are highly comorbid with other mental disorders, notably depression, anxiety, and in particular, po post-traumatic stress disorder. We loop back up to the early stressors. And we know that sex, race, and ethnicity can also affect a risk for uh, substance use disorder. That work is still going on. Um, there, you know, um, the gap uh, between males and females in, in vulnerability for an alcohol use disorder has been narrowing over the last 10 years with females um, predominantly increasing their vulnerability. You know, in particular, I like to emphasize that childhood stress and adolescent substance use have an effect that we call a, an increase in allostatic load. You can think of that as kind of the weight being put on these systems that I just talked about. And so, um, you know, there can be demographic factors, physical environment factors, psychosocial factors. They interact with substance use at a young age, and they produce an increase in your stress system. This has been measured in humans, cortisol, an increase in your autonomic nervous system, stress system, epinephrine and norepinephrine. There can be increases in autonomic measures that reflect these uh, hormone changes like uh, blood pressure 
and, and metabolic effects. And these all can contribute. Um, and, and it makes it really important because there's one other piece of information you really need to know to put this all together. And that is that the front end of your brain, that frontal cortex, that executive function system doesn't fully develop until the age of 21. And so um, you can see here that um, both, there are two changes going on. The gray matter um, is, is a, a trimming going down on, of, of gray matter. So you lose cells in the frontal cortex because you're keeping some cells and not others, but you're growing the connections to the back of the brain, to the, to the areas I've been talking about that control impulsivity and stress responsivity. And that's the, the white matter, which are the tracks. So the tracks are going up over time as you mature and the frontal cortex is shrinking in cell number. And, and so that can explain some of the vulnerability, particular vulnerability of, of young people being exposed um, to alcohol before their frontal cortex is fully developed. And we're getting data in now to suggest that in fact, the effects of alcohol are more powerful on adolescents than they are in adults when it comes to frontal cortex function. So finally, I just want to kind of wrap up and put on my NIAAA hat again and say, well, what good is all this information? What can we use it for? Well, one of the things we're thinking about using this neurobiological information is for diagnosis. We feel that if we can diagnose according to the stages of the addiction cycle, we won't, we're not going to stop using the, the wonderful criterion produced by the American Psychiatric Association, but we're thinking of having add-ons that will maybe give us insight into perhaps subtypes of alcohol use disorder. Maybe there are people who are more interested in the binge stage. Maybe there are people who are more self-medicating. Maybe there are people who have more of a cognitive deficit and that's what's driving um, their excessive drinking. Um, treatment. You know, um, our institute supports an enormous amount of research on trying to understand the molecular basis for how these circuits that I've been telling you about change. I've listed here some of the uh, uh, neurotransmitter systems and their molecular targets that are affected in the binge intoxication stage. You can look at these. Um, some of them are, are potassium channels. Some of them are dopamine receptors. You can look at others that are associated with the withdrawal negative affect stage. Some of them are familiar. Corticotropin releasing factor, kappa opioid receptors. These make you feel lousy when they're activated. And then others are more involved in in the glutamatergic system, you can see on the left-hand side, maybe cortical function and, and, and some of their molecular targets. So we have a lot of hope and we have a lot of energy being put into the hypothesis that by targeting these molecular substrates, we may be able to find new treatments for alcohol use disorder that will help people along the way and maybe more also better diagnosis so we can tell who's vulnerable and, and what ameliorative steps can be taken um, for those individuals. So what have I told you? Um, I learned in the Army you're supposed to tell people what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So here we are. What I've argued is that addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disorder with potential for recoverance and recovery. Um, we don't grow back the brain, but we can strengthen the systems that are still there. And I can elaborate on that later if, if anybody's interested. I've argued that addiction is a three-stage cycle, becomes more severe with continued substance use, is a binge intoxication stage, a withdrawal negative affect stage, and a preoccupation anticipation stage. I've argued that the cycle is associated with dramatic and persistent changes in three principal brain regions, the, the basal ganglia, that was the blue bit, the extended amygdala, which was the red bit. Remember the basal ganglia reward, the extended amygdala stress, and the prefrontal cortex, if you want, thinking. I've argued, and you know, just to, to emphasize those points I just made, that, that, in the, that the basal ganglia enables substance associated cues to trigger substance seeking, producing an increase in incentive salience to drug related cues. Um, that, 
in the withdrawal negative affect stage is a reduced sensitivity of the brain reward systems and a heightened activation of other brain stress systems producing dysphoria, malaise, hypohedonia, and stress during withdrawal. Um, and then reduced functioning of the brain executive control systems, the frontal cortex, which are involved in decision-making and regulating actions, emotions, and impulses. Brain changes persist long after substance use stops. It is not known how much these changes may be reversed or how long it takes, but this is an area of intense study. I've emphasized with you that adolescence is a critical at-risk period for substance use and addiction. And I've argued that all addictive substances have especially harmful effects on adolescent brain, which is still undergoing significant development. So what does this mean for, for my original title and charge with all of you? What's the significance of a, a, a medical framework for addiction? Well, first of all, addiction has many features in common with disorders such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. All of these disorders are chronic subject to relapse, they're influenced by epigenetic, epigenetic, developmental, and environmental factors, the same as addiction. Um, I might add that, that it, when it comes to the medications used to treat addiction, that people are just as bad about adhering to their medications for hypertension or diabetes as they are in adhering to medications for treatment of, of alcohol use disorders. The shift toward understanding addiction as a medical condition, a perspective supported by decades of neurobiological research, has helped reduce the stigma associated with alcohol and other drug use disorders. The chronic disease model of addiction has relevance for women who struggle with alcohol use disorder during pregnancy. Birth mothers of children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are often stigmatized by the public, not only for their struggles with alcohol, but also um, for uh, exposing their unborn child to the harmful effects of alcohol. Such stigmatization only adds to the negative affect and stress that promotes and sustain alcohol use disorder. I remember way back in the beginning, I said, I like to emphasize the dark side of addiction. I like to emphasize the withdrawal negative affect stage because it has been underemphasized in the field. And this is one of the reasons. One of the reasons is because when you perpetuate guilt, when you perpetuate negative emotional states, you are perpetuating one of the mega reasons for drinking or continuing to drink. And then women with um, uh, alcohol use disorders who uh, are pregnant or planning a pregnancy should be referred to a healthcare provider or a local alcohol treatment program who can provide empathetic, evidence-based treatment for their condition. Education about alcohol is a teratogen and alcohol screening should be part of all prenatal care. And that's my bottom line. If we, if we think of this as a medical condition, if we weave it into the fabric of prenatal care, maybe we can prevent um, a large proportion of, of uh, these unfortunate uh, situations where um, the fetus is exposed to alcohol. But, but I think in any case, a critical part of um, what we see at NIAAA as, as an important issue is getting empathetic treatment for alcohol use disorder because the earlier there's treatment, the less of the problem evolves, the less severe the problem becomes, and it's, it's, it, it could save us, to be totally honest, a great deal of suffering and a great deal of medical costs if you want to be totally concrete about it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Koob. That was just perfect. Um, we really uh, appreciate you putting that together for us. And if it's okay with you, we have a few questions. Is that okay? Yep. Great. Great. Samantha, you want to go with the first one? Yeah, so the first question we have is, if a pregnant woman with an alcohol use disorder has a child that was prenatally exposed, is that child more at risk for addiction? I, I, I think the evidence suggests that the child may be um, at more at risk for addiction. I think there's still ongoing work in that regard, but the, the animal model work does indicate, as I understand it, that um, subjects who have been exposed to alcohol um, prenatally um, 
um, under certain environmental conditions, like uh, uh, you know stress and and ex and uh, uh, exposure to alcohol, are more likely to have a problem later in in, in life. Great, thank you. Um, another question has to do with uh, addiction as a medical condition versus a psychiatric uh, disorder. And so the person's asking why so many, if we know this is a medical condition, why do so many people uh, believe that this is more of a behavioral a self-inflicted psychiatric issue and what can be done to change that? Well, I, I'm the ultimate reductionist. So um, from my perspective, perspective, a psychiatric condition is a medical condition. So to quote Paul Summergard, who was the president of the American Psychiatric Association a couple years ago and gave a, his plenary address to the American Psychiatric Association, he said, if you've never seen an alcoholic in your um, um, practice, you're delusional. And from my perspective, um, I would consider a major depressive disorder as a medical condition. I would consider um, an anxiety disorder as a medical condition. And I would consider a substance use or alcohol use disorder as a medical condition. Now, having said that, then one could well, ask the question, why are psychiatric conditions so, still so stigmatized? And that's a question of an issue of education. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we're, we're doing what we're doing today. And I hope I, I you know, in some level made that clear that um, if we understand that the brain is changed, then we have something that we can work on. Um, how you got there, whether, you know, is, is, is is obviously involves some choice, but so does diabetes, so does heart disease. Um, you're born with certain predispositions, but if you if you are eating poorly and um, and overweight and not getting exercise, which are also choices, you are going to exacerbate or even trigger your endogenous vulnerability to having hypertension or diabetes or both. And how is that different than a psychiatric disorder where everyone in your family has a history or the large proportion of your family has a history of alcohol use disorder? I don't see a big difference. I mean, if everyone in your family has a history of alcohol use disorder, you know, something, and I've had friends that have had this, been in this situation. Some of them actually join Al-Anon and they just decide they're not going to drink. Others say, you know, I never have more than one drink or, or whatever, you know, standard works for you. But I, you know, I mean, both my parents uh, died of, of uh, heart disease. Now, fortunately, they lived to be 85 and 90. So, um, you know, the genes were in the right place. But nevertheless, you know, I, I make a point of doing the things that are important for my thumper. <laughs> thank you. Go Great, ahead. thank you. Um, so another question we have is, can someone become addicted solely based on environment or must there be a genetic history? I personally believe that people can become addicted just based on their interaction with the environment. And I say that because I know that drugs change the brain. I think that people can have a genetic loading, which makes it a lot easier for the drugs to change the brain. Um, and I think, you know, there can be a combination of both. So, you know, if you have, uh, uh, you know, an environmental situation, like you've been abused as a child uh, in, in any number of ways, you're your brain may have certain vulnerabilities because of genetics and you get into a crowd or an environmental social organization where you end up drinking a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a bad combination. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Sorry, I'm just reading through this. So, 
Well, that kind of uh, fits into this other question where uh, the person was asking, so if you have situations where people are exposed to very addictive substances, for instance, soldiers that were in Vietnam and they use, uh, got addicted to drugs, why is it that only a certain percentage end up addicted, but others were able to kind of leave the environment and continue on. I, I think that kind of made made the point you just uh, made, spoke to the uh, information you just gave us. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, that's a very good point, And that is a fact that uh, only a very small percentage of the individuals coming back from Vietnam um, um, really pursued their addictions. Some did, but most didn't. And there are a whole variety of reasons. One is incentive salience. So the cues of Vietnam were not in the States for most of them. Um, and, and so the, the cues that would trigger the craving weren't there. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, being in a war zone is far from pleasant. And I'm sure it was a very stressful and dysphoric environment. So presumably those that came back to an environment that was supportive and much less stressful that factor was eliminated um and and you know uh, and then the third is a very maybe it's considered a trivial issue but back in those days the, the heroin that was available in in uh, vietnam was pure enough that you could actually smoke it and and those coming back to the states would have found the heroin a, a much less potent that, that of course changes and and goes up and down and so on and so forth but I, i'm more likely to think it is the environmental issue both from the the reward side and also from the stress side. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next question is going to be that is NIAAA ever going to research the paternal role in causes of FASD? Oh, we we already are. Um, there is a chap named Deepak. Sarkar, S-A-R-K-R, and you can look up his work, who is a pioneer in this area, and he just pushed investigator award from the Research Society on Alcoholism. So we already have grants out there on this topic, um, and there's some very intriguing work that se it seems to indicate that there may be some possible epigenetic uh, transfer through the possibly the Y chromosome. So I urge uh, whoever's interested in this to, to look up Dr. Sarkar's uh, uh, work. Great, thank you. That's good to know. And this question has to do with the opioid epidemic. They're asking, um, uh, do you think that women that use opioids are using alcohol and why aren't doctors understanding this and why aren't doctors being held responsible? Well, I, the latter two parts uh, are difficult to answer, but the answer is yes. We know that 15 to 20 percent of opioid overdoses also involve, involve alcohol. And my scientific advisor, Aaron White, thinks that's probably an underestimation. So we do know that alcohol is a powerful component of the opioid addiction crisis. Nora Volkoff, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and I have talked about this quite a lot. Um, we do also know from basic pharmacology that when it involves alcohol and opiates, two plus two equals five. So what that means is that uh, a, you know, a moderate amount of alcohol and possibly a moderate amount of opiate can kill you. And, and what that means is it's not just additive, but it, it, they, they can potentiate each other. And both of them are, are decreasing respiratory drive. And so that could be the basis for the, for the overdose issue. From the prenatal exposure, it, it, it becomes a real issue because, um, I mean, I don't know much uh, study where people have, have combined both drugs, but it, it certainly could one would think would produce a potentiation also of any um, uh, prenatal exposure if, 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 if both alcohol and opiates are being used. And, 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 and I think will, is quite worrying. So, you know, um, there are people looking at these issues. 
Um, but you know, thanks for for raising the point. It's a very valid one. Yes, indeed. Um, we just have a, a few more. Um, go ahead, Smith. Okay, so our next question is: Why are some ethnicities so vulnerable to addiction? For instance, the Native Americans. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I wish we did. Um, we know that, again, there are multiple factors. There, uh, there are uh, environmental factors, but there probably are genetic factors. Um, it is a, one of the mysteries that remain. Um, you know, why are, we don't even know why the sons of alcoholics um, uh, are more likely to become alcoholics in the, or the sons of alcohol use disorder and daughters are, are more likely to become to, to get a, to eventually develop an alcohol use disorder. We know that there's a genetic loading, but we don't know what what the genes are. I mean, we have some hints. There are certain genes that involve potassium channels, some that involve um, some of those stress neurotransmitters I showed you, some that involve the, the GABA and glutamate in the, in the frontal cortex. So some of the targets I had on that slide are also the targets that that the genetic studies are leading us toward. But we're hopeful with the new genetic techniques, uh, better cohort, better um, uh, amalgamation of cohorts and storage of the data, that we'll be able to uh, get an answer to that. It's a very good question. Thank you. And one last question. What can be done to educate doctors and other healthcare providers about addiction and why is it that they don't know more about it? Well, we think, I think personally, uh, um, we've been working with the National Institute on Drug Abuse on this. We don't think that physicians are getting adequate training in addiction, addiction treatment, pain management, opioid prescriptioning. And, and so there's major efforts underway by the NIH to, to remedy that. We have had several meetings in the previous administration at the White House to discuss how we can affect better education. Um, there is some education in medical schools, but the medical students themselves, um, by all the metrics we have, don't feel that they're getting adequate training, particularly in pain management and addiction. And so um, we have supported at NIAAA, and NIDA has as well, the development of a medical specialty for addiction, the fellowship program for training residents in addiction. And that's a great step forward and that will help in the training because the residents will be training the interns and the interns will be training the medical students. But we also want to initiate a bottoms up approach where we get more in the medical curriculum, more on the medical board exams about addiction and how it interacts with other medical illnesses. Great, thank you. And so that wraps up our questions. Uh, we wanna thank you, Dr. Coop, for joining us and presenting today for this webinar. We also wanna thank all of our participants. Um, just as I said in the beginning, this webinar will be posted online on Monday on the NOFAS website and on the NOFAS YouTube channel, Alcohol Free Pregnancy. As I also said in the beginning, if you're interested in receiving the NOFAS Roundup, which is our weekly newsletter, you can email information at nofast.org, as well as like our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. And we invite you again to our Facebook chat on Tuesday, September 26th on the NOFAS Facebook page, where we will be joined by university students, champion physicians, and our affiliates. Thank you so much, everybody, and, and Dr. Koob, that was just terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, Well-needed information. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.